Hello everybody and welcome to Toolkit's Poetry live broadcast. My name is Melody Paloma. I'm the facilitator for the Poetry Toolkit, an express media program uh, run in partnership with Australian Poetry. So tonight we're joined by Omar Musa, who will be speaking on the topic of poetry for social change. Omar Musa is a Malaysian Australian author, rapper and poet from Queanbeyan. He's the former winner of the Australian Poetry Slam and the Indian Ocean Poetry Slam. He has appeared on ABC's Q&A and received a standing ovation at TEDx Sydney at the Sydney Opera House. His debut novel, Here Come the Dogs, was long listed for the Miles Franklin Award, the International Dublin Literary Award, and he was named one of the Sydney Morning Herald's Young Novelists of the Year in 2015. He released, recently released his new hip hop EP, Dead Center. So thanks so much for joining us, Omar. Yeah. I'm super excited to hear what you have to say on the topic of poetry for social change. Um, so I'm gonna shut down my mic and video for now and let Omar take center stage. Uh, but please tweet us any of your questions using the hashtag, uh, hashtag EM toolkits. Uh, and we'll leave a little bit of time at the end for Omar to answer any questions that come through. Okay, over to you, Omar. Cool. Thanks, Melody. All right. Hello, everyone out there. This is completely bizarre. I'm sort of just talking out into the ether, uh, into the cyber abyss, as Melody called it before. Um, but I'm going to keep this fairly casual. And then, yeah, please send some questions through. I usually like uh, if I give a talk, I, I like it um, when there's a bit of interaction, but I guess it's hard in this, in this particular situation. Uh, but here we go. So, in a famous TED talk by Nigerian author Chimamanda Adichie, she warns against the danger of the single story, reductive narratives about people and peoples, the perpetuation of which has real life consequences. I grew up in, we grew up in, we live in an Australia where oftentimes, Oftentimes, these types of narratives are given major airplay and political backing, whether it be in the mouths of Queensland senators, Australian prime ministers with dog whistles firmly stuck to their bottom lips, or concerned citizens who use their million watt voltage to speak of people who often don't get the chance to speak back or tell their own story. The type of language used, whether it be obfuscating bureaucratic talk or the sledgehammer blows of jingoism, serve to uh, polarize society into black and white, us and them, good and evil, and can have a narcotic effect on those who are its victims, leaving them apathetic and incapable of action, lacking in confidence, and sometimes even more dangerously internalizing the hate that is enacted upon them. Luckily, it's an antidote, and that's what we're talking about today. Words and stories, when flipped and used in an imaginative, vibrant, heartfelt way and distilled into poetry, can be a powerful tool of protest, social change, rebellion, and activism. They can be laughter in the dark. They can allow the outsider to speak back, if not wage a war upon the center from the fringes, which is the same as speaking truth to power. So today, by chance, I was, uh, cruise, I was just perusing Facebook and I saw an article uh, pop up that was on World Literature Today by the Israeli poet Rachel Sevier Beck. Uh, and it was about the power of poetry as protest and how it enables us to speak difficult truths uh, in the midst of conflict and in a troubled world. And she said that she believes poetry has three intrinsic attributes that make it useful for awakening a social contra conscience. One, the drive towards accuracy and truth-telling. Here she says, unlike political speech, as I mentioned before, poetry cannot afford to misuse language, for in misusing language, it negates itself and its own purpose. So that kind of distilled truth-telling is a part of poetry. Number two, she says, the personal accountability of the poet. The poet, as an individual, must stand behind his or her words they are responsible for their words. And so that kind of got me thinking actually in an Australian context about how oftentimes the type of language um, that a politician uses when they are in public life as opposed to when they leave politics is very, very different. And oftentimes 
they blame their political stances and the w type of language that they use uh, on pragmatism and towing the party line. Uh, and so th they blame their use of language on that. And the third attribute, she says, and she admits this one almost defies definition, is that poetry has a magic uh, where meaning and music intertwine. She says that there is an interface between the personal and the, po and the political that with the imagination and talent accesses the truth in a visceral way that offers us alternative, redemptive visions of our world. So as I've said many times, uh, I wrote a, I did a TEDx talk at the Opera House and, and the main thrust of it, I suppose, was this, that there is immense power in hearing from those who are so often spoken to, at, or about. And we can think of so many different types of people uh, in this country, um, you know, whether it be uh, women or people of diverse uh, sexual orientations or Muslim people, young Sudanese people, uh, indigenous people, so often spoken about or at. Um, so hearing from these people and hearing their stories, I believe, adds complexity and nuance to cultural, social and political debate. And at the very least, it can make people question their assumptions about others, about themselves and about the world that they live in. At its best, this type of power, uh, this, this type of verbal power, energised, physicalised poetry can help people um, understand those around them, those that they might be scared of and extend compassion, that hackneyed word, towards them. Who knows, a shift in consciousness might act like a contagion and lead one day to major societal transformations or even legislative change. So I'm going to tell a couple of personal stories here. When I was young, the most famous Indonesian poet who ever lived, V.S. Rendra, came on a tour of Australia to perform his poetry and he happened to pass through Canberra, which is right next to my hometown, Queanbeyan. And somehow my parents uh, managed to persuade him to come around to our little flat and have some rice and curried chicken, which actually turned out to be a disaster because he hated chicken. Um, there's some pub trivia for you about the most famous Indonesian poet. But he was this very exuberant, charismatic uh, man and a great performer. And they called him Burung Mera, which in Bahasa Indonesia and Malaysia means the, the peacock. He kind of had his shirt open, this long flowing black hair. But when he walked in, you know, he had this very commanding presence. And, and my father and my mother took me aside and they pointed at him. And I must have been about eight or nine years old. And they said to me, you see this man? This man is a poet. But when he performs his poetry, he does it with his breath and blood and fully physicalized and it is performed and it's rich and he doesn't just do it in small dusty old rooms to eight ten people he does it at political rallies he does it at protests he does it on stage to thousands and thousands of people and it would rile people uh, people up so much his uh, his political opponents people who didn't agree with him that even at one point uh, when he was performing someone threw a bomb on stage and another time he was locked up in jail uh, by the Indonesian government for his political beliefs. And I kind of uh, realized then at an early age that poetry uh, could be revolutionary, uh, that it could be dangerous in all the right ways, uh, that it could really uh, instigate all sorts of uh, intellectual discussion and heat the blood up as well. Um, and that it was fun as well. That's the other thing, that it was fun. I guess as the Israeli poet was saying, there was this kind of combination, this magical combination of, of, of meaning and, and form and imagination. But when I went out there into the world, I realized that uh, poetry was considered dusty and pretentious, but not just that, it seemed very tied to an exclusive uh, academic establishment. Uh, and, and crucially, it was largely white. And so for someone growing up as a young brown boy, an Asian Australian, a young Muslim man, uh, in a place where whiteness or being an Anglo-Australian uh, 
were seen as being a, the legitimate type of Australian. And oftentimes I felt like an outsider. This meant that uh, it seemed in a way that poetry was not for me. Yet I had already seen just because of this, just by chance, that it actually could initiate social change and be woven into the social fabric of a society. Uh, and so I went looking for a form of poetry like that. And I remember uh, I was also at the same time as I was looking for poetry like that, I was looking for Muslim role models because I didn't really see many around me at the time uh, in Australia in the public. So I went further afield and there was this documentary on SBS about the black Muslims um, and about the black power movement. And I remember being really uh, intrigued and obsessed by Malcolm X and Louis Farrakhan and how they could move these huge crowds with their fierce words, uh, with their charisma. And it sounded like poetry to me. Uh, and so I, would, I, I, I taped it on VHS, if any of you remember those, and I watched it again and again. But right at the end, I remember that there was, uh, in, in 80s Technicolor, these two guys jumping up and down on stage, reciting poetry over a rhythmic drum beat. One of them had a very deep, distinctive baritone voice like a preacher man. And the other one had gold teeth and a clock around his neck. So, of course, it was public enemy. And what they were doing seemed so cool, but so intensely political and personal. They were talking about racism. They were talking about injustice. But it was in a way that was accessible and that was immediate and was being made by young people of color. So, obviously, completely different social situation to me growing up in small town uh, Australia but I could immediately uh, relate to that. And then I also saw, you know, that kind of parallel because they were called the most dangerous group in the world or the most dangerous group in America. Um, and so not only, uh, and, and so the, the, the politics was not just confined to uh, the rarefied air of Parliament House or something. It was something that was on the streets and it was very, uh, and it was organic. And the other thing, about hip hop was that it was okay to be intelligent. You know, when I was growing up, it was footy or fighting. That was the way that young men especially uh, expressed themselves through violence uh, and toxic aggression. And so this provided a different avenue for me as a frustrated young man to turn those negative thoughts into something positive and maybe even eventually change the minds of those around me. Um, so I guess time went on and uh, I heard about slam poetry, spoken word poetry, and it was definitely in its fledgling stages in Australia at the time. Uh, and let's say this was maybe 2005, 2006. I actually went my first poetry slam just to make up this because they, uh, they didn't, have enough people to go in Canberra Poetry Slam, and I don't think they had many people in the audience either. Uh, I remember it was straight after the Cronulla riots, and I had done um, done a poem about the Cronulla riots that I can barely remember now. It was probably really really lame, but you know it was, it was an early piece. Um, but I remember I got on stage and I performed it, and because there wasn't the music behind it like there was um, with hip hop, uh, people were listening very very closely. And I remember someone coming up to me who happened just to be dragged along to it, saying that it had changed their mind about, about Australia and about um, their positioning in the whole scheme of things. And in those early days, I, uh, I think it's safe to say I was one of only a handful of Muslim people or people with a Muslim name, background, however you want to define it, performing poetry and poetry slams and in, in quite a public way in Australia. And I'll never forget, even though I'm not Lebanese, I just remember so many young Lebanese kids would come up to me and say that I had inspired them to write poetry. Now, 10 years on, I've seen this sea change and I've seen it grow as this almost revolutionary force in Australian letters, where people of so many backgrounds who often would feel disenfranchised or voiceless or, or that they didn't have a place telling their stories um, in a public way, a safe space for dangerous thought. Now you're hearing them. You know, the, the, you see in Melbourne so many kids 
um, of African descent, uh, Pacific Islander kids. Um, you, you hear kids that maybe uh, at school um, would feel ashamed to um, speak about their sexuality. They can speak about it uh, in a poetry context uh, and they have been afforded this space. And, and what a liberating thing that is. And now, only 10 years on, the biggest poetry slam in Australia uh, is in the western suburbs of Sydney, the Bankstown Poetry Slam, largely uh, patroned and run by young Lebanese Australians, young Muslim Australians, people so often talked about. I mean, you only have to open up any newspaper or watch, you know, Sonia Kruger talking about um, Muslim people in such a reductive way that all of a sudden it seems a very revolutionary act for a young person just to get on stage and tell a story and tell it proudly and tell it fiercely and tell it with dignity. And I believe um, that it is having kind of a revolutionary effect on Australian letters also hand in hand with the internet because uh, all of a sudden a living, breathing poet uh, can be taken directly from the other side of the world or somewhere in Australia via YouTube into the classroom or they can invite uh, a poet to come in and actually perform. Uh, and it shows people that poetry is living and breathing. And I don't think spoken word is the be all and end all. You know, oftentimes people get me wrong and they think that maybe that's what I'm saying. But I've just seen how um, it has been such a useful tool in, in getting young people interested in poetry, uh, whether it be in youth centres, uh, in high schools, or even in jails, uh, you know, and that those who have so often been demonised and dehumanised can become human uh, or, or show themselves to be human um, and change the discourse of this country. And I actually think uh, that aside from uh, the dignity and self-confidence that it affords these people, um, it also, in terms of the arts, uh, this rise of spoken word poetry and slam poetry is going to start feeding into other areas of the arts. And we're already seeing it with someone like Maxine Beneba Clark, um, you know, who's delivering a keynote address at the Melbourne Writers Festival and has had a couple of immensely successful uh, books, you know, short, story, short fiction memoir. But she came from the spoken word world. And I think that over the next few years, we're going to start seeing that. Um, really uh, feeding into script writing, uh, playwriting, fiction, of course, but crucially, hopefully, also uh, into politics and legislation so that there can be people of more, quote-unquote, diverse backgrounds, to use that weird word, uh, feeding also into public life, uh, which has so long been a domain uh, of middle-class white um, and so hopefully, you know, I, I would like to think that it has this contagious effect. But as I said, um, you know, I don't want to overplay its role. Uh, I don't think it's the be all and end all. Uh, you know, people often ask me, can a poem change the world? You know, can a song change the world? I'm, I'm not sure it can, you know. Uh, oftentimes, uh, guns and paperwork change the world. Um, but uh, I think that a poem... Um, can be a catalyst, it can be a spark, you know, it can be uh, an emblem. It can go hand in hand with revolution and legislative change. Uh, but at the same time, I have seen so many cases uh, because, you know, I, I'm very privileged uh, in that I am able to send my poetry out there into the world and, and different schools and youth centres and, and jails oftentimes use it um, and give it to young people to read or to respond to. And I've had a bunch of letters from... Uh, some some young women in in jail and I, I remember quite a few of them saying that uh poetry had uh, had actually saved their lives you know not just reading poetry or responding to poetry but being given the chance to write their own poetry had uh stopped them from taking their own lives uh you know and that affected me greatly um and it made me think about uh in my own life uh, in my own family you know um well, for myself, it's always been a coping mechanism and kind of a, a proto form of therapy. But my grandmother um, in Malaysia, she is from uh, the Brunei border, the border of 
um, Brunei, Indonesia, and Malaysia in, in Malaysian Borneo. Mm. I remember her being very impressed by the fact that I had gone to university and that I had finished high school. Um, and she once told me something that I'd never heard her say before, which was that she, uh, she said to me, oh my, you know, I never learned how to read or write. And you are a poet now, you, you write books. Uh, but did you know that when I was living on the streets from the age of seven or eight, I created over 50 poems in my head, um, four line rhyming pantoon poems. She said, I created over 50 of these and they helped me survive. They helped me, they helped me endure. And so I realized then that, okay, you know, she couldn't eat the poem. It wasn't a bowl of rice, but the poetry to her was as essential as breath or blood. Um, and so I guess just to conclude and maybe open it up to a couple of questions, uh, I'm just going to conclude with um, a couple of quotes from two of my heroes. The first being my mother, who says that at the heart of tragedy and at the heart of drama, and I'm going to extend that to include poetry, is, uh, is the indestructible human spirit hell-bent on destroying itself. You know, and I think that's nice and I think that's true. And I think the poet, that poetry is part of that indestructible side of humanity. And then the second quote I'm going to give you guys is from Bertolt Brecht, the great uh, German playwright and poet, who at one point said in response to the Nazi book burnings of, in, in 1939 that uh, there was little we could do, but without us, the leaders would have felt more secure. So it's not everything, but it's something. And it's our way of speaking truth to power, our limited way of waging a war upon the centre from the fringes. Thank you. That was completely bizarre, sort of talking to you all out there like that. Thank you so much, Omar. That was great. Um, mm. Unfortunately, you. we haven't had any questions come through on Twitter, uh, right. but there's still time if anyone wants to send anything through. Um, I might just ask you a quick question while while we're waiting for maybe some other questions to come through on sure. Twitter. I suppose I wanted to talk to you as someone who uses many different forms. You write novels, uh, short stories, um, poetry on the page, uh, spoken word, rap. Um, mm -hmm. Do you find that one of these is sort of more effective when you're thinking about inciting social change? Like how do you, how do you choose when you have um, a message that you want to get across? It's really hard to say. I mean, I'll probably go into this a bit further um, when, we have, when, when we look at some of the poems uh, put up. But, um, you know, the stuff that lives on the page or the stuff that is recorded, uh, it lives on, you know, uh, beyond your own flesh and blood and kind of existence and and there have been so many times uh when a poem even you know 60 100 500 years after the poet's death uh, is used as some kind of political slogan or an inspiration for social movements um but i think that in terms of kind of immediacy and directly relating to people there really is something about being there and performing to people especially young people uh, and it's so transportable, you know, I mean, you can just, I've, uh, you know, I, I remember being part of a poetry slam in France where, uh, you know, they've got this whole thing where, oh, poetry, you know, it must be lived, it must be, it must be in the streets, you know, and they kind of got us to go into kebab shops and into just burst into classrooms and start reciting poetry. And, and I think um, there, there is such um, power in, that, uh, in the performance. Um, and I think also it taps into those ancient, oral traditions uh, where poetry was so ingrained in the cultural life of a society um, and it combats that idea that poetry must only be for an elite or for academics and I don't actually have such a huge problem with that like that it's fine that there's that type of poetry and some of it is absolutely brilliant um, but I think there just needed to be a kind of circuit breaker um, 
to allow it to be a little bit more accessible. And from what I've heard, I mean, you know, I haven't been around that long, but the, it, these types of debates are cyclical and, um, you know, there have been so many times uh, in Australia and in this world literary history where people have said poetry is dead, you know, po poetry has died um, because of this type of thing. But then, you know, there's a resurgence um, or a catalyst. And I think that's that spoken word and slam has been that over the last 10, 20 years, maybe 30 years if you, you're talking about the States. Um, but I'm sure, uh, you know, there's a, it can also be done very badly like any type of poetry and and uh, and probably could become boring and, and mundane and seen as equally pretentious as the way I saw a lot of academic poetry. And so they'll need to, something else will have to come along and reignite it. And do you yeah, think anyway, to answer your question directly, there, there is something very special about that kind of form type of poetry where someone can look into your eyes and, and you're speaking directly to them. Yeah, great, great. Um, we have had just a, a question come through on Twitter. Um, yeah. Someone has asked, hey, Omar, what are some Australian novels you admire for aiming to make that difference? I'm going to extend that as well, considering we're talking about poetry specifically as well and maybe some um, poetry, poetry collections or um, spoken word artists. Um, I heard a really good one. You, you, you guys will like this. Um, Wesley Enoch, the great Aboriginal um, play, playwright and director, quoted Uncle Kevin Gilbert, famous uh, Aboriginal poet. Uh, he, he was talking about um, Andrew Bolt and uh, Kevin Gilbert had said, you sharpen your spear on the hardest stone, which is just brilliant, I think, when in terms of kind of poetry and uh, this is what we're up against. If our words as poets are our spear, then, then these jingoistic, nationalistic psychopaths that are running around with so much power, they are the hard stone on which we wet ourselves and sharpen ourselves and sharpen our poetry. Uh, so Kevin Gilbert, that's someone to look, look out for. Uh, novels, poems, um, well, I mean, Christoph Schulkes to me is probably one of the bravest novelists um, writing in Australia at the moment. I think The Slap, which is, you know, uh, it, it's a book that will divide a room immediately. I thought it was a really great uh, kind of anatomy of the middle class and kind of uh, apathy and selfishness uh, in Australia, especially in terms of, well, I guess it divides, it, it breaks down stuff to do with race, class and gender. But then Barracuda as well was, was really brilliant. Um, uh, in terms of breaking down class and what's happening in this country in terms of that. Uh, I think um, there are so many poets, I mean, uh, sh showing the different kind of facets of our society and telling the story untold. Uh, Abe Nook is a great uh, Sudanese Australian poet who could not read or write 10 years ago, apparently, and is now this brilliant performer in English, you know, not even in the language of earth, which is amazing so a-b-e-n-o-u-k abe nook you can look him up uh you know maxine beneba clark is great um ellen van nierven um and is an aboriginal uh poet and fiction writer who just had a book called comfort food come out and had a brilliant set of short stories come out um that kind of that a, a lot of which is about um identity country uh authenticity and also gender um, and, and, and how those things interface uh, in terms of uh, intersectionality. And, um, and, that, and so she's, she, she's brilliant. Um, Nam Lee, I mean, he is one of our finest writers, hasn't put anything out in ages, which I'm always at him about. Uh, God, man, it's just, it's hard for me when someone just kind of drops that, drops that on me. Mm. Um, and then, of course, if we're talking about poetry, I mean, I, I consider hip hop to be poetry too. So there's someone like Sampa the Great, Zambian um, girl who's been making music over here for a while. Oh, you're suddenly in the dark, Melody. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, lights come out. Continue. <laughs> and um, and then uh, Remy uh, Briggs, you know, th these guys um, who are really uh, talking about race in quite a sophisticated and ferocious way and a very accessible way uh, that gets people who might otherwise not be too interested in in dealing with it you know it's 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 what krs1 called edutainment back in the day in the in the 80s in the hip-hop world um, 
where you can discuss these sophisticated, complex issues and really think about them and problematize them. But it's in such a such a personal, uh, vivid way, and that was what drew me to hip hop in the first place as well. So there's a there's an array of um, different people there. That's great. That's a nice big list for everyone to go and look up. I yeah. mean, I suppose when you when you think about who your favourite artists are in any kind of genre or form, I mean, do you feel like they're all sort of working towards social change in, in some way anyway? I'm not sure they, they necessarily have to be because then sometimes um, the language can become a bit blunt if it's just um, a polemic kind of tool, you know. I think... Does um, it need to be polemic though? I mean... No, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. But I think um, good poetry and good literature at, at very least interrogates the light and dark of the person who creates it in a personal way. And that can't help but be political in, in some way, um, mm. you know. And if people put that work out there um, where they're interrogating themselves and making themselves uneasy, because I really do think that in some way the best art comes from the author or the artist or the poet making themselves uneasy. Uh, it's a more authentic way of then initiating that unease in an audience. And then we were talking about Bertolt Brecht. You know, he would always say that that tragedy um, or a well-made play uh, allows people uh, too much catharsis that they then become unable to act. Whereas if you, well, he did it through didactic theatre, but if if you make the audience feel uneasy, um, that's the best thing to provoke in an audience because it makes them question assumptions and perhaps be able to act in the real world upon what they have figured out about themselves or about the world. But the only way to do that is by making yourself uncomfortable. Um, it's much more authentic that way. Yeah, that's a really good thing. So, yeah. It, it's sort of, you know, um, that, that can't help but be political. Um, you know, and, and it might not be something that's informed by a book of philosophy or an ideology. Uh, it can be something that people feel out in a much more intuitive way. I mean, if we're looking at Australia, someone like Patrick White, he, would say, he often would say that he wasn't particularly political and that the politics in his books he felt out intuitively. But there's no way you can read his work and say that it wasn't questioning what Australian society was about or what politics, you know, gender politics, class, race, whatever it might be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it just can't help but be. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, we've had a couple more questions come through as well. Uh, the first one from Zenobia Frost. Um, Hello. She's asked, are there any poems, yeah. uh, sorry, are there Poems you always turn to when you're in times of great need slash feeling slash anger. Um, yes, but I'm going to be talking about them in the second. Can we talk about them now or are we? Uh, um, oh, we, we can leave that till later. I mean, maybe you just want to mention what they are quickly so um, people sure. watching the live broadcast can then go and look them up and then we can discuss them. God, these things are always so hard, aren't they? Like, you know, it's mm. like when someone asks you what your favourite movie is, I always just think of, like, the most recent one I saw that I liked. Yeah, it's horrible. Um, yeah. Uh, so, well, well, some of the ones we're going to talk about after this. The, the, the ultimate one that I already mentioned before is To Posterity by Bertolt Brecht. I mean, um, you know, if you haven't read, I, I feel like every poet worth his or her salt, um, every human should read that and memorise it. I'm being completely hypocritical because I haven't done that. Um, <laughs> but I would, I, I wish I had. Um, and that talks about, yeah, how there was, there was little we could do. But it also talks about uh, kind of the inherent paradox in being someone who fights for justice um, and fights for, for peace um, because the brow grows stern and um, grows to be like stone in the face of oppression. So oftentimes we might become like our oppressors. But... But that poem has given me a lot of solace um, in really hard times. That Kevin Gilbert one also, you sharpen your spear on the hardest stone, for sure. Um, I'm just 
such a hard, hard kind of question. What about Australian poets? Um, well, see, this is something that's interesting because uh, oftentimes people talk about the poets that inspire them and, and they talk about people who uh, they have never met, very, very famous people. But I'm influenced a lot um, by my peers, um, you know. So people like, I come from that background, a spoken word background. So people like Alia Gabrez or Abe Nook or Luca Lesson, Emily Zoe Baker as well. I mean, those people inspire you. I think the people who are kind of uh, around you and then you can see what they're doing that works or, you know, you can pick up on signals that they put out there. I've kind of uh, been inspired by them um, a lot. Yeah, great. Um, we've just got one more question from Rory Green. Um, would love to hear more about the proliferation of spoken word in the arts. Do you think it needs inclusion by academic poetry? When I mean, you touch on this a little bit before. Yeah, I mean, I think that they just, they just, they have to, don't they? I mean, it's become such a popular art form. Um, you know, oftentimes this uh, dichotomy is built up um, between the page and the stage. But I find that that's largely one that's just kind of constructed. Um, mm. You know, it's not actually real. Like if you get people in the room together, page and stage poets, they're all lovers of words and they can often find commonalities. Um, and it depends on whether they're doing it well as well. Um, I mean, I think oftentimes people are a bit slow on the uptake. I've noticed that, you know, I've definitely come against uh, snobbery and opposition from uh, not just academics, but, you know, English teachers and everything as well uh, that really think about the canon in a certain way. Uh, and I think we need to kind of break that down. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, if they can't see it, then they can't see it. And just don't really care because we're bringing it out to thousands more people. Um, you know, I mean, spoken word artists uh, sell a lot of books when they're touring, but also on YouTube, you know, they often get hundreds of thousands of views which compared to what constitutes a bestseller in Australian poetry, which might be like you know, 300 books, mm. uh, it's really getting out there. Um, and, and I've heard people be quite, uh, you know, dismissive and call me a, a pop poet or something like that. But I find, uh, you know, and, and these are kind of more academic poets, but I've, I take that as a compliment because, yes, it is more popular. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's impossible to ignore. I mean, yeah, it's great. Um, we might leave it there, I think, and um, wrap up. Uh, so thanks, everyone, yeah, for joining. Sorry, I feel, Zenobia, contact me outside of this and I'll have more time to think about it. The poems that, that really give me good solace. Well, Zen's in, Zen's in the um, class, so you'll have okay. plenty of time to talk. Cool. Great. Um, but thanks, everyone, for joining our live broadcast. Thanks, and thank you, Omar. That was fantastic. Uh, so everyone, please feel free to share this link um, among your various social networks. Um, and also make sure you tune into our other live toolkit sessions um, by the Express Media homepage. So Benjamin Laird will be joining me on Tuesday, the September the 6th at 6.30 to talk about digital poetry. Uh, Luke Carmen will be joining the Creative Writing Toolkit on Tuesday, August 30th at 6.30 to talk about character and voice. Uh, and on Tuesday, September 27th at 6.30 again, uh, Alice Grundy will be presenting on editing and publishing for the Creative Writing Toolkit. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.